Hello, I'm Susan Regan, your host for Connecticut Valley Views. And my guest today is Joseph Nolan. He is the chairman, president, and CEO of Eversource, the largest supplier of energy in Connecticut. Mr. Nolan, may I call you Joe? Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, Joe, as you are well aware, the hardworking residential taxpayers, <clears throat> inclusive of business customers of Connecticut, are facing one of the most challenging economic periods in recent history. This culminates <clears throat> not only with the national inflation concern, but during the winter season in the Northeast, which brings us to the core of our interview. As you have shared with customers, regulators, and the public, electric rates have increased by 50% beginning this month in 2023, realizing a projected estimate of an additional $80 to the average homeowner's monthly bill. The origin of these increases come from the costs that distributors pay to purchase electricity from power generators and pass along to customers at a cost under Connecticut's deregulated electricity market, which I believe is referred to as pass-through charges. Is that correct? And please address all of those concerns and how Eversource is responding to that. Great. Well, first of all, Susan, thank you for having me on. It's really a pleasure. And uh, we are faced with some unprecedented times, you know, whether you're in the, uh, you know, gas or electricity delivery business or whether you're even delivering firewood, gasoline, oil or propane. All of these different industries are facing extraordinary uh, increases in cost. And it's particularly difficult for our customers. Uh, I have known that I have been in this business for 38 years and I think I can only recall maybe one, maybe two other times uh, that would face this type of volatility and significant price increases. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's really um, a job I take very seriously. We go out to the marketplace every three, six, nine, and 12 months, and we procure energy on behalf of our customers in Connecticut. Uh, and we're always out there looking for us to get the lowest possible price. Uh, but given what's going on in the world, uh, today, with uh, with the war in Ukraine and Russia and uh, these fuel supply issues that have uh, been challenging folks, uh, it, it's it's caused this chaos in the energy markets that we go to. It's you know it's a marketplace we go to. We buy on behalf of customers. Generally, it's rather smooth, uh, but right now these uh, energy markets that sell the power to us uh, are obviously in a very defensive mode because they're worried about this volatility. They don't know what it's gonna cost. And the piece that's driving this is the fuel. It's the input that they need to generate the electricity. And that's whether it's oil, it's natural gas, uh, whether it's coal, whatever that is, that commodity right there is so volatile that these, that these suppliers that own these generating units are so worried uh, that they, you know, that they could see some spikes that they can't control, uh, that it's all, manifesting itself in these very high prices. You know, the other troubling thing around it is there are some kind of segments of the market that these market is uh, and energy supplies, they won't even bid on. So right now we are out in the marketplace procuring it actually on a daily basis on behalf of customers. That's how volatile these folks did not want to bid on that. Generally, we go out, we lock in the supply and we ride through. But some of it is so, uh, it's so scary to these folks that they don't want to do it. And that's why our team in energy supply, um, you know, they go out and they buy it. And then what, whatever we pay for it is what we what we sell it to the customers for. You know, the piece, uh, there's two pieces, as you know, there's the energy supply and this deli delivery portion. The delivery portion uh, is the piece that is fixed. That's something that we go uh, before our regulators. But this energy piece is the volatile piece. That's the piece we are seeing is massive swings. Uh, so that's really what has been taking place in the marketplace. Well, <clears throat> When, when you have your, your customers um, hearing about these things, they often come through in the media and they're very frightening to people because you have, uh, as you well know, many people who are on fixed incomes, older people, retired people, and <clears throat> they do have concern for the fact, will they be able to heat their homes? Now, thus far, this winter, uh, we've been fairly fortunate with temperatures uh, but one never knows what's going to happen coming February, March. We still have um, some of those things. Now, <clears throat> do I understand correctly that there are 
some people who are providing the supply side, including yourself, they either have six month rates or annual rates. So once you're locked in, however, at some point during those either six month or year, they can stop and they can change suppliers. Is that correct? Yes. So, um, you know, there are opportunities for anyone to go to the marketplace there. Actually, the site in Connecticut is Energize CT. You go out there and you can find all of the suppliers uh, that are willing to sell uh, energy in Connecticut. And we encourage customers to do that. I mean, the educated consumer is really the best customer ever. They'll see, uh, no matter where you go, that, that there are some significant uh, increases in, in price. Our customers can switch uh, to other suppliers. You know, it does not hurt our feelings. Uh, and when we lock in, we lock in in these three and six month increments. But that doesn't mean the customers locked into that. Our customers actually can go and, and switch. Um, and I would encourage folks to do it, but also to be very careful. I mean, there's, there, there are unscrupulous suppliers out there. Uh, it's funny when I get the calls on my cell phone and they let me know they're calling from Eversource. I know it's very interesting. Uh, tell me a little bit about this. Joel, what's your account number? So, well, gee, if you're, that's funny. If you work for Eversource, I would expect you to have the account number. So I have, um, I have engaged on more than one occasion uh, and I have switched uh, to this person because I'm trying to find out who are these rogue suppliers. So I have them go through the motions. We have a dialogue. I switch. And then I wait for it to come through our billing area. Then I find out who is this rogue supplier that is saying the things that they're saying. And they're saying that they're going to save you 5, 10, 20 percent. Uh, and it's simply just not true. So that is the real danger sometimes. And, and that's why we have to be so mindful of the person in the counterparty that you're dealing with when you're buying energy because uh, you can see some swings uh, in energy prices very quickly i mean it can happen on in a 30-day increment that would would really really surprise you um so we do encourage folks to look at that uh you know it, and look at it carefully but watch that bill i mean it's you know it reminds me of the days when when we got to the long distance service and at t kind of had everybody captive and you didn't know you could go to other other suppliers and consequently, people's bills were through the roof. You'd call someone in California, you'd get a bill for thirty, forty dollars for a couple hour conversation. Where MCI or Sprint or these other ones, you know, you've got unlimited calling. So that's the type of thing you have to be so mindful and careful of. Well, I I also think that uh, when it comes to uh, people receiving their bills and they're feeling that they are. Uh, I guess have been overcharged with the current supplier. As you said, some people are not familiar with the fact that they can switch and they feel that they get their delivery and the supply all from Eversource. But as you said, they can actually shop around and that it's fairly easy to do. Now these, ro these rogue suppliers, uh, how do they, I guess, do they do phishing? Do they try and contact uh, people? How do they manage to get themselves uh, involved with the customers? Well, you know, like all uh, good scams, they just have a, uh, a phone bank and they begin dialing. And then you get somebody that's interested on the other end. Obviously, anyone you call right now, and if I, if I said to you, Susan, I can right. lower your electricity bill or your right. push, you're going to gravitate to that. Uh, you know, so you might make 100 calls and maybe 20 of them or 10 of them are interested. And, you know, that's what takes place. And then they get you engaged. And then interestingly enough, you begin to tell them about your situation, your bill, your account number. Then all of a sudden they're feeding it back. You say, well, clearly they must know uh, because they've got my information. But exactly. it gets you so caught up in the conversation uh, that it's, 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 you know, it's, it's obviously disturbing. Uh, obviously. Now, um, <clears throat> in November 2022, there was a Connecticut Insider article, and it stated that you had submitted an October 2022 letter to President Joe Biden, in which you said that such a waiver would allow foreign flagged vessels carrying liquid natural gas to stop at multiple U.S. ports, including import facilities in Everett, Massachusetts. Also, you proposed using the Defense Production Act to boost domestic energy supplies. Could you further delineate on that recommendation? Sure, I'd love to. So, you know, right now uh, we'll, we'll take uh, LNG, which is liquefied natural gas. So if you want to move natural gas, you need to liquefy it. They take it very cold temperatures and they put it in the tank and that allows you to move it, whether, you, whether it by a truck or by a tanker. Uh, in the U.S., there is not one um, U.S. flagged LNG tanker. And you might say to me, 
Well, what, what's, what's the big deal on that, Joe? Well, if you don't have a U.S. flagged vessel, that vessel can only stop once in America. So unfortunately, what's taking place is uh, right now there's probably six or eight uh, foreign vessels in the Gulf of Mexico. They're filling up with American uh, liquefied natural gas, and they are going to leave America because they can't stop in America. So they're coming and taking American fuel, they're leaving. Now, if I wanna buy fuel, if I wanna buy LNG to fill up my reserves that I have, that tank is coming from Trinidad. I mean, this is, this is so frustrating to me that I can't get a tanker to come from the Gulf, bring it to some ports where I can uh, take delivery of it. It has to be a foreign, it's, number one, it's foreign LNG. It is a foreign tanker, but it only made the one stop. So I'm very frustrated. So I wrote to the White House and the type of response that you get, uh, this is just an analogy that I'm going to focus sure. on oil, but the response that you get is, okay, well, gee, let me know um, the tanker you want to use, the country of origin, where the fuel came from. And what I'm trying to explain to them is this is going to be a crisis. We are going to hit a point in time where we need this fuel because generators can't run. We're not going to have time for this red tape this bureaucracy. You need to understand that we're in a very fragile uh, state right now. So, you know, I'm very frustrated by it. I'm frustrated that American fuels are leaving America uh, and they're not being able to be used yet. Oil, oil in this region, you know, right here in the Northeast, these, these uh, different um, generators, they only have little under 50% stored because they, it's so volatile. They don't want to take the risk. If you're stuck in May, with fuel that costs you six dollars a gallon, and then it goes down to three because there's not demand. You know, I was saw the uh, I saw the federal government, um, you know, in its greatest form during Superstorm Sandy when I was down in Connecticut. You know, we couldn't get fuel. You might recall you couldn't get fuel anywhere. I mean, I was I was right on the border in New York, Connecticut. We we're trying to bring the power back there, and I'm running on empty with my car, and I had to try to find a place. Finally, I got one gas station, but it was that point where the leadership and the federal government stepped up, they opened up some of the uh, fuel reserves and the tank is rolled and we were able to get fuel to all of these much needed stations so that the people of Connecticut could get fuel when they needed fuel. So the government has the capabilities. They just need to act. They need to show leadership around this. I will tell you that over Christmas, um, you know, between the probably the 23rd and the 26th, we were in the most delicate point of time around energy supply. The generating units did not have enough fuel. And we were at a point within a several, a couple of hours of having to start to shed load. Uh, and this is, this is preposterous. I mean, we have the generating units, but the fuel wasn't available. And this is the frustration that I talk about. You know, not only is it bad, I feel bad customers for the high prices. Can you imagine not having it? You can't even get it. So worse. This, this is worse. Yeah, exactly. So these are the frustrations that we're dealing with, but this is what's driving this volatile high prices of energy uh, in the state. All right, well, now let's move a little bit uh, more specifically to uh, the what the Connecticut energy consumers are seeing in their mail this month. Uh, I think this is the month where it's actually gonna hit home. And uh, I'm just gonna hold these up, but uh, this is actually a, a, you know, a sort of a generic bill, if you will, and there are generally three or four pages, but these are the, the two pages that generally someone will receive in the mail. And we have the supply side and we have the delivery side. And obviously you also have the comparison on the bar chart that shows you where you are from last month, from last year, and people can, um, can view that. Now, um, you have defined, and, and let's define this very carefully, which I, I believe you have supply cost and the delivery cost and where these um, costs are incurring. You're saying that the delivery side, basically you can supply, you can also supply as well, or people can shop for being supplied. But is the, the increase is only happening on the supply side. Am I correct Cor in stating correct. that? Correct. Okay. All right. Now, when these... How there are line items on here as well. I'm just going to read these off here. There's a uh, on the uh, supplier side service reference. There's a generation service charge, and there are several line items here: distributor cost, service charge, electric system improvements, distributor charge per kilowatt, 
revenue adjusted mechanism, CTA charge per kilowatt. Of, all of these line items, the average layman, when they get their bill, doesn't really know what how this money is used. And are all of these line items actually directly involved with energy supply and uh, supply side? I mean, do we know where this money is being used or how it's being used? Uh, and do they really apply? I mean, is this something, are all of these line items something that your customers should absorb? Yeah, sure. So when I started in this business 38 years ago, uh, you got uh, one line item. It was 750 kilowatt hours, and this is what it cost. And then over the years, as we uh, got out of the generation business, uh, we then just focused on the delivery. And there was a desire, and I think it was a smart desire, to bring transparency. Folks should know where this money is going to. So on the delivery side of it, you know, a lot of things are involved in that. That's the poles, the wires, the meters, the trucks that are out maintaining it. Interestingly, um, you also see on this delivery side of it, um, the costs associated with, say, energy efficiency, some of these other programs that, quite frankly, are we're out there with our with the major employers in Connecticut, with the consumers, with residential customers, helping them reduce their consumption, uh, because that is good for everybody. If we can reduce, you know, our carbon footprint every day, it's going to save you money. It's right, the right thing to do for the environment. The other piece that's in there uh, is the charges associated with the millstone. You know, we are buying from Millstone um, under a long-term contract. And quite frankly, it's a very favorable contract at this point. It's under five cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, it was a it was a great thing for our consumers. And I, I sure uh, am pleased as I look at this volatile market, that's a nice little slug of energy to have that's feeding in there. That's the only kind of generation piece that is you'll see on the delivery side. But that really is benefiting customers. So all customers are going to uh, enjoy the benefit of clean carbon free power out of millstone it's it's home it's homemade right there uh, so i think what happened is you know in a in an effort to be transparent to allow customers to understand to see where all these charges are they broke out every item but again some of it is just i mean delivery and transition and you know people get you know frustrated with those charges and you're always say oh what's this here what's that there and, um and and, and i completely understand people's frustration around that bill uh well exactly the way you build trust with people and and when when you tell them something the way when you give them an answer they want to be able to believe you because if in fact they can understand it it's the understanding of why they're being charged the rationale behind it and i think that going forward there needs to be whether it's uh, by Eversource or it's by legislators or um, Pura, but I do think that more investigation into these line items, an explanation, and perhaps even an accounting for where and how this is being used. I think that's going to build trust with your customers going forward. Now, in actuality, can the legislature or Pura, because I know uh, Pura, it was deregulated, and do you see that coming back where Pura might have more authorization over these increases? Well, I mean, increases in the delivery, they have it. I mean, we uh, we have to appear before there every single charge that we have. Uh, exp you know, all our expenditures are, mm -hmm. are an open book. Um, you know, we get a return uh, of roughly a little over 9% as our allowed return, and, and for that, we have to deliver service. But you only get that if, if you're delivering you know, if you're delivering for our customers. I mean, if we have poor performance or something takes place, uh, as you know, we had the storm Isaias. They felt as though we, we hadn't performed at the levels that they expected. We spent, uh, we had to pay over $105 million, uh, which was a lot of money uh, for our company. And uh, we did that, but I'll tell you, I think if you talk to folks now around storm response, um, I think folks will tell you that uh, it's 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 a whole different ball game. We have uh, a portals now for each community to be able to input their priorities. You know, when, when we did the ESAIS, that was the middle of the pandemic. You know, we had to get one vehicle for every employee. Uh, every all, A lot of the hotels were closed because so we had no place to really put the uh, uh, the 2,500, 3,000 crews that we had. Sure. Uh, so it was a challenge, but we learned a lot from that experience. Um, we've invested a lot of money in emergency response. So, you know, for that, you know, customers deserve to have top shelf service because they're paying, you know, they're paying top prices. 
Uh, and that's what I, you know, I obviously demand from my employees. You know, we have over 9,300 employees uh, working every day uh, that to make sure that the, the lights stay on, the gas is flowing and the water is flowing. And, you know, we have water, gas and electricity in Connecticut. Uh, and I will tell you, I think I have, you know, some of the hottest, hottest, hottest working employees uh, in the state. Uh, well, you know, that's interesting about the emergency situation. I think as much as the high prices, uh, what people have to pay, uh, what might happen in the future and so forth, I do think that the emergency could, now you have been able to call on from other states if Connecticut has been hit particularly hard uh, with a storm or whatever. Um, so you have a good working relationship, I take it. You can draw these additional help and, and uh, trucks and so forth uh, to come in. Is that right? Yes. I mean, do you have yeah. meetings? Do you have meetings actually with the other, you know, other uh, electric companies in the other states? We do. We have a very, very uh, uh, interactive mutual uh, aid program. Uh, you know, one of the things that took place with East Aeus is that storm, as you know, was coming from the south. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of times we get resources, they come from the south. And Nobody will give you resources until the storm has passed over their territory. Wow. And I don't blame them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it as well. But, you know, we, we took some extraordinary steps that we actually are really get 90 line crews uh, out of Washington State. Uh, and, and Eversource has about, you know, several hundred pieces of equipment that we have in a staging area. So those crews get on planes, they come here. So they can hit the ground immediately. The other crews, they come down from Canada. Uh, and so we have a very, very good session. I was actually with a group of the CEOs and we, and we do have a, a, a also not only a formal network, but an informal network. I've got friends in the Midwest because, you know, quite frankly, you know, after after Isaias hit, I, I don't know if you uh, right in the right in the end of it, a direct go hit in the Midwest. And so after we got through getting everything back, we were able to 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 send our crews there uh, and help out uh, this last crew. You know, over Christmas, we had folks in from Canada. We had we had thousands. I mean, Christmas Eve, I'm. I was pleading with these employees, telling them, listen, you're going to be Santa Claus to our customers. <laughs> yeah. We've got to get them on by sunrise. You know, and, and I think when the sun came up on Christmas morning, you know, we were, you know, probably 10,000 customers. Uh, and these were the real the fun. Christmas ones. trees yeah, lit up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, those are the types of things where these, these employees really give up critical uh, holidays with time with their family because they understand the importance of delivering energy. Uh, with regard to, I guess, looking to the future, do you see any, um, I guess, improvements? Um, are, are there things that you look towards uh, improvements in some way? Do you see using robots doing anything and taking the human, you know, element out of it? Um, what kind of futuristic things do you see with yeah, regard so to this particular now, which, which is fascinating is, um, you know, once that storm hits, as you know, all the roads, all the roads are blocked because of trees. Uh, we're now setting up drones. Uh, we're setting up helicopters. Um, you know, I was up during East Aeus, and one of the things that impressed me the most, we're making a lot of investments in the system, is the transmission system, which is the heart and soul. That's the, that is really the backbone. That system held up amazingly well. You know, I was up and we were kind of patrolling some of the transmission lines, and there was a tree that was resting on these transmission towers, but it never took them down. And they came in with a crane and they removed it. So, um, you know, I think what you're seeing now happen is between drones and other types of um, uh, automated technology, we're able to see what we're dealing with the problems. We also have the ability on a full app phone, on the full iPhone to be able to take pictures of damage so that when the crews are going to, you know, five Jones Street, they know I need a transformer. I need a cross arm. I need a pole. They're already knowing the equipment they need. And that's the most important thing that when we mobilize these thousands of crews, they need to have the supplies because if the supplies lag the crews, customers see them sitting around. They don't like to see that uh, in our staging areas. So that's what you're seeing, tremendous coordination um, to get the roads open, make them safe. Uh, and that's critical. But, you know, trees, trees in Connecticut. I mean, there was significant uh, tree uh, infestation that took place. And these trees are falling. And uh, when they do, they, I mean, some of them are so massive. Uh, and for that, we have to get in there first and remove trees, you know, we, which is interesting that the utility is responsible for moving trees. But um, well, you know, is that actually a department? Is that is, actually that's part of your uh, human resources is to have the guys who do the tree part? Yeah, we have a okay. significant vegetation management group. And these folks are working in cities and towns every single day of the week. 
They're talking to communities about danger trees. They're telling them this tree right here is going to have a, we're going to have a problem with this tree. And we had 10 communities that kind of got involved in a pilot with us where we show them trees that are going to cause damage, that are going to affect critical facilities, police, fire, hospitals, nursing homes. If this tree comes down, it's going to take out two, 3,000 customers, and they work with us. And it's it's been a real great that, partnership. That's, that's, that's fantastic. Well, it, Joe, uh, you seem to be an extremely hands-on fellow, and you've, you've been in this business for 33 years, and um, I think continuing to get your message out. So I'm hoping we can have you back as a guest uh, at some point later on. Uh, that we can catch up and and uh, find out, and hopefully that uh, our energy costs will go down. But <clears throat> what I'd like to do, and um, you did men mention the supplier costs, uh, which you can go to www.energizeconnecticut.com, uh, and people can shop there, and it should be fairly simple and straightforward. But I think what's very important for Eversource is that there is a, a website, and it's eversource.com forward slash bill b-i-l-l -L, help uh, and there if people are struggling with their the costs and their bills and their invoices they can find various subject matter uh, to contact eversource and perhaps a range of payment schedule um, to organize to fit people's budgets so if we have that correctly so very much appreciate your candidness today joe uh, your time and effort that you've put into helping the people of connecticut and uh really appreciate having you on the show thank um, you susan so much and i look forward to coming back on the show excellent excellent and to our viewers as always you can see uh this segment and all of our shows and you can reach me via our website ctvalleyviews.com this is susan regan thanking you to Joe Nolan for being my guest today and thank the viewers for continuing to watch Connecticut Valley Views.